help if I turn it on. Is this on? It is on. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is a real pleasure uh, to have Ambassador Westmacott with us today. Uh, I must tell you, however, I woke up in the middle of the night with a nightmare. And the nightmare was that Ambassador Westmacott was running a competing think tank in Washington, D.C., and my market was disappearing quickly. I mean, this is, I've had the privilege of, uh, of listening to the ambassador on numerous occasions, and I, there's no one more gifted in the world of uh, analysis than this man. And, uh, and frankly, he, had, he would steal the show if he were running a competing think tank in Washington. I'm so glad I woke up and realized it was just a dream, and, and a bad dream at that. Uh, so instead, I have the great privilege of welcoming him here. Um, uh, th this is a, an individual who, uh, in the very best tradition of fine diplomacy, uh, listens and understands an audience far better. He, he doesn't spend time talking, he spends time listening. And it's the reason that you see such deep insights uh, into what's going on in this country, how we're interacting in the world, and how this very special relationship that we have with the United Kingdom is shaping that world. And so we're very, very fortunate that he's uh, offered to spend some time with us today uh, to give insights into how the United Kingdom is moving through challenging days, but moving through those days uh, with a great deal of, uh, of uh, energy and deliberation, and how, what it means for us. Uh, we, we tend to not spend enough time thinking about these fundamental positive values that we have and how it reinforces what we can do together. So I, I'm re this is exciting, and we're delighted that you're here. Uh, Peter, thank you for joining us. I, I must say, I've been looking forward to this, and I'm so glad, not as a competitor, but as a, as a beneficiary. Would you please welcome Ambassador Westmacott? <laughs> Maybe that works now. Uh, Dr. Hamway, thank you so much. That's a very scary uh, introduction. The bad news is that I am going to talk a little bit, and then I'm going to look forward to listen, listening to people's questions and comments, um, which may or may not be related to what I've got to say. Uh, but the, 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 the discussion afterwards is always the most fun part of it. But it's a, it's a great privilege to be here, and I've not set foot in this very smart new CSIS building before now. So that's also uh, a first for me, and I'm thrilled to be here. And thank you all for coming at this rather early time of the day. I'm going to speak for a, a, a few minutes uh, about, if you like, the UK place in the world and what we think we're doing and our perspective on some of the current issues, um, scampering over a number of different subjects, and then we'll uh, stop as soon as I can and get into the fun part of it. But today's rather a good choice of date for this discussion, from my point of view in any case. Uh, the first is the point that John Hamry was making, which is that I think in terms of diplomacy, uh, today is important in that we are having another go to see whether we can reach agreement on what we call a first step uh, understanding between the P5 plus one and the Iranians in Geneva. Uh, we think that's a very important opportunity. Uh, we, the Brits, and the rest of the P5 plus one think this is the moment to try to reach that interim agreement and see whether we can build on that and produce something comprehensive if the Iranian side is serious about it. But I'll say something about that in a moment. And the second reason, which is a rather sadder one, why it's an important uh, moment for me at least to say something about the United Kingdom and its diplomacy and, and our role in the world and its relationships, is that today happens to be the 10th anniversary of probably, in fact certainly, the worst terrorist attack which British diplomats have ever sustained. And nothing compared, I'm sorry to say, to some of the terrible attacks which Americans have sustained. But uh, in Istanbul, 10 years ago today, the consulate general, uh, when I was ambassador in Turkey, was attacked by a pickup truck with two and a half tons of explosive, which killed 10 of my staff and two of the policemen who were guarding uh, our premises. And my foreign secretary and the permanent secretary of our foreign Commonwealth office are in Istanbul today uh, and commemorating that loss of life and that terrible event, uh, which is a reminder, I think, of the risks which diplomats, journalists, academics, many other people these days face uh, as they try to make a difference in some of the more dangerous parts of the world. The United Kingdom has, to state the obvious, perhaps uh, always been a trading nation and driven by geography. 
to engage with the rest of the world uh, far away from our own natural borders. And over the centuries, we have developed networks of global interests and relationships, taking advantage also of the fact that we were the, countries in w the country in which the agrarian and the industrial revolutions took place. So we feel we've got history as well as geography in our favor in establishing where we come from and to some extent what we are today. We got less than 1% of the world's population, but we got the sixth biggest economy, and we've got trading links around the world. We're fortunate enough to have top table membership of all the major international bodies, Security Council, the European Union, World Bank, G8, whose presidency we hold this year, and of course NATO, and there we're proud to be acting as hosts of the NATO summit next year in Wales. And our military is able to meet threats wherever in the world that they arise, even very far away from home, on land, on sea, in the air, and in cyberspace. We even like to think that our foreign service remains amongst the best in the world. Of course, I'm entirely objective in making that comment. <laughs> but we are the employer of choice of university graduates in the United Kingdom, beating the oil companies, the investment banks, and even the BBC, uh, which means that we are still able to attract the best recruits. We can't always keep them, but you know, some of us who can't be employed doing anything else stay till, <laughs> stay till the end, uh, and the others at least uh, have the experience of working for what we think is one of the very finest diplomatic services, at least for a while. And we're bucking the general trend, which is that we are growing our diplomatic network. We are opening or reopening 20 new embassies and consulates, despite the fact that we've got a flat cash settlement from our treasury in terms of resources. And we're trying to direct that particularly towards emerging uh, regions and uh, continents, Latin America and Asia in particular. We've now got an embassy, I think for the first time in many, many years in every ASEAN country, and in pretty well every uh, Latin American country. And of course, we have an unparalleled partnership with the world's most important and powerful democracy. And it's often said, but I think it bears repeating, that whatever the United Kingdom sets out to achieve in the world, we have no more important partner in those endeavors than the United States. And in the 20th century, that partnership played a very important role in facing down fascism and in subsequently winning the Cold War. And we think it's been instrumental in confronting and disrupting global terrorism since then. Even as we continue to strengthen our links in Asia and Latin America and Africa, our special relationship with the United States and the values and the mutual respect on which it's built remain vital to our ability to shape the world that we live in. And we see this in the way we're squaring up to some of the challenges which we're all facing today. Some, like the Syrian civil war, the Iranian nuclear program, are pressing and urgent. Others, like climate change, are slower burning, but their effects are no less devastating. And to meet them, we need the wisdom to identify and tackle the root causes of these problems, the courage to take difficult decisions, and the strength of purpose to commit for the long term. In Iran, just to look at some of the current issues, the P5 and 1 plus 1 have steadily increased the sanctions pressure while offering to enter into genuine negotiations, which is, I think, why we end up where we are today with the opportunity in Geneva to make a real difference. It's a strategy, um, the effect of those sanctions, and perhaps now uh, a determination on the Iranian side to try to recalibrate its own relationship with the rest of the world, which has brought us back to the negotiating table for serious and detailed talks. There are remaining gaps between the parties, but we think that they have narrowed considerably, and we think it bodes well for the outcome of the talks which have started today. If we get that right, we could see a preliminary deal either now, this week, or in the coming weeks, which would give us the opportunity to build on that to test the Iranians to see whether they want a comprehensive settlement which will, once and for all, reduce, if you're, sorry, remove, I should say, uh, the risk of the Iranians developing a nuclear program which has a military dimension to it. In Syria, perhaps even more pressing in terms of the humanitarian crisis which it has spawned. More than 100,000 people have been killed. Don't need to remind this audience of that. There are 4.2 million people displaced internally and 2.5 and million refugees uh, in the neighboring countries. British public opinion, like American and French public opinion, were skeptical about military action, even after the evidence of industrial-scale use of chemical weapons. But the threat of that military action, in our judgment, did play an important role in creating the pressure 
for the plan on which we're now working to destroy serious chemical weapons. That plan is progressing better than most of us actually expected or even dared hope. But foreign policy, perhaps like legislation on Capitol Hill, sometimes seems a bit like sausage making. The process isn't always pretty, but what does count is the product. And yet, despite moving ahead on the chemical weapons front, Assad continues to terrorize his people with more conventional means of destruction. And we urgently need a political solution to end that bloodshed. And that's why Britain and America have thrown their full weight behind the move towards the Second Geneva Conference. The Syrian National Coalition's decision in principle to attend those talks we think is good news. There's no question of withdrawing from our commitment to Syria's people, quite the reverse. The United States, the United Kingdom are the two biggest humanitarian donors. Our aid package at $800 million at the moment and counting is the biggest we've ever made of its kind. We're feeding almost 350,000 people a month and we've provided medical support to as many again. And we're working closely with Syria's neighbors like Lebanon and Jordan and Turkey to cope with the huge influx of refugees that they're having to shelter. 2,000 miles further south, a broad long-term approach is slowly paying off in Somalia. 10 years ago, it was a failed state. Most of the rest of the world had pretty much written it off. Today, there are clear signs of progress. Somalia has witnessed a peaceful handover to a new president and parliament, the culmination of the most representative political process in that country in a generation. Ami Sam and Somalia's security forces have retaken territory from the Shabab. The economy is slowly reviving. Even the diaspora is coming back. The UK has put together two international conferences on Somalia. The first, in February 2012, was instrumental in completing the political transition and providing an extra 5,000 troops for the Amisom contingent. And by the time of the second conference in May of this year, the Somali government itself was able to draw up its plans for developing armed forces, police, justice system, and public finances. And as well as staving off hunger and disease, UK development assistance is helping to build up Somalia's economy by rehabilitating damaged infrastructure. And we think this approach is paying dividends because it pulls together the three vital strands of security, governance, and growth. Because it's Somali-led, and because the international community has been and remains prepared for the long haul. What happened in Nairobi in the Westgate terrorist attack was a horrible reminder of how far there still is to go and what Shabab are capable of. But such atrocities remind us of the dangers of allowing failed states to fester. They should redouble our determination to get Somalia back on its feet. The unprecedented response to piracy in the Indian Ocean shows what's possible when the international community works together. In the first nine months of last year, there were 99 pirate attacks. In the same period this year, there were just 17. None of them succeeded. And this is a result of a united international approach. NATO, European Union, China, Russian Federation, Japan, India, all contributed to a naval effort. And on land, we've supported countries in the region to prosecute and punish pirates locally. And of course, the effort that we, I was just describing to try to develop Somalia's governance and economy helps provide young Somali men with realistic alternatives to piracy. And we need that kind of coordinated response in other areas. For example, we can combat the recent growth of terrorist kidnapping by agreeing once and for all that we don't pay ransoms to terrorists. In the past three or four years, Al-Qaeda-linked organizations have extorted, by our reckoning, at least $70 million by kidnapping foreign nationals. Ransom payments fund terrorist recruitment, encourage more kidnapping, and pay for outrages like the attack on the Inamenas gas plant in Algeria. Kidnap for ransom is a major part of the terrorist business model. We can break it by refusing to pay. This year, for the first time, the G8 countries, led by Britain and the United States, made precisely that commitment. My prime minister knows from bitter experience, because we have lost lives in the process, how difficult and emotive decisions like this can be, especially when your own nationals are amongst those held by the kidnappers. But we remain determined to suffocate this source of terrorist funding. Another tragedy that transcends national boundaries is the sexual violence that so often accompanies conflict and other emergencies. The statistics are sobering. In the 100 days of the Rwandan genocide, one-sixth of the female population of Rwanda is estimated to have been sexually assaulted. 
rates of sexual violence dramatically increase during humanitarian crises and military conflicts. Yet prosecutions are shockingly rare. And to tackle this impunity, the United Kingdom has put together a team of experts in fields like criminal investigation, forensic science, and law to help local authorities gather evidence and build cases against the perpetrators. And that team has already been deployed in the Syrian border areas to Bosnia, to Libya, to Mali, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And we're working at the political level to encourage other countries to take a similar approach. More than two-thirds of the United Nations members have signed up to the Declaration of Commitment to End Sexual Violence in Conflict, which my boss, William Haig, launched at the UN in September at the General Assembly. Next year, we will be hosting a major forum on the issue. And it's work which builds on the efforts of Hillary Clinton under the American G8 presidency last year. Reports of widespread sexual violence in Syria and of criminality in the aftermath even of Typhoon Haiyan remind us of how urgently progress is needed on this front. We're also committed to the wider task of empowering women and girls around the world. Depriving them of the chance to release their potential is not just morally wrong, but it holds up the economic development of whole countries. And one of the most important ways of reversing this injustice is to support female leaders. The Vital Voices Project, established here in the United States by Hillary Clinton, Milan Bavir, and, and others who were powerful advocates of the cause, is one such valuable program, also supported, as it happens, by the British government. It makes a difference by providing training for women leaders who want to realize their potential but have been held back by problems which limit their capacity to do that in all areas, politics, business, and society more generally. One of the other gravest international long-term challenges, which I touched on very briefly just now, is climate change. We think that the evidence is overwhelming, it is happening, and human industrial activity is largely to blame. And amongst the regions that will be hardest hit are some of the most volatile, like sub-Saharan Africa. Resource scarcity combined with existing conflicts and new extremes of weather make for extremeless, extremely combustible mixture. In a networked world, it is everybody's problem. In 2008, we became the first country to pass legally binding emissions reduction targets. We were instrumental in pushing the European Union to set its own 2020 targets. We're keeping up the pressure for even more ambitious 2030 targets. And what all of us need now is a global deal backed by tangible commitments. President Obama's climate action plan reinforces America's credibility in arguing for such a deal and is likely, we believe, to make a real difference here on the ground. Thanks to his plan, and in no small measure to the shale revolution, we have every confidence that the United States will meet its carbon reduction commitments, which it made back in Copenhagen. It's a good start, but we're all going to have to do a lot more if we're to avoid the worst effects of climate change. In the long run, the answers to many of these challenges are going to have to come from sustainable global development. In the UK, we're proud of the fact that we are the first major economy to meet the agreed target of spending 0.7% of our gross national income on development assistance, a commitment we've managed to maintain even, even as we've had to make some pretty swinging cuts in other areas of public expenditure. It's the right thing to do. We can't stand aside while three quarters of a billion people lack drinking water and girls in southern Sudan are more likely to die in childbirth than complete primary ed education. We're in a position to help the poorest and help them we should. That, by the way, is an assessment with which our citizens all agree. Tax arrangements and an extraordinary culture of giving make America one of the most generous countries in the world. Yet even in 2010, when our economy was at a very low ebb, the average British household gave $160 per head to, sorry, per family to overseas uh, development causes, while in America the figure was actually at 135. So both of us making a huge contribution, both domestically and internationally. Development also helps our own economies by opening up markets and creating opportunities for trade and investment. And it's an important tool of national security. Ungoverned spaces breed threats like terrorism, crime, piracy, extremism, disease, and uncontrolled mass migrations. We've got to help those countries before they become broken which is why the UK is committed to spend a third of its foreign aid budget on assisting fragile states. Meanwhile, we've been looking hard at the effectiveness 
of what we do with our development assistance. We've moved funds away from underperforming programs and organizations. We've clamped down on corruption and put checks in place so that citizens can actually see where their tax money goes when it's spent on international development. And some years ago, we got rid of the requirement that food aid had to be spent on British produce because we think that the alternative approach based on the market means we can get more food to where it's needed more quickly and more cheaply. We know what the conditions are for genuinely sustainable development. Peace, law and order, defensible property rights, accountable government. My Prime Minister David Cameron has linked them together in what he calls the golden thread of development to allow countries to escape from poverty and dependence. It's not just a British idea. The high-level panel on post-2015 uh, development goals for the United Nations, of which David Cameron is co-chair along with the presidents of Liberia and of Indonesia, has recommended global targets on open government, free political choice, rule of law, property rights, and freedom of speech. And putting these values into practice is a very ambitious program, but an essential one. Nowhere is our support more urgent today than in the Arab world. In the very early days of the Arab Spring, the UK established an Arab partnership with $180 million of funding for projects to strengthen fundamental building blocks of democracy like the media, like election observers, legal and judicial systems. This kind of work and the other efforts needed to realize the promise of the golden thread can't be carried out by one country acting alone. So we put it at the top of our agenda for the UK's presidency of the G8 this year. G8 members are now helping developing countries build, amongst other things, tax collection systems. One example, the UK has helped Ethiopia increase its tax take sevenfold in less than a decade. Tax revenues, we may not all like paying taxes, but they pay for services and infrastructure. And by funding official salaries, they reduce demand for bribes. We must also face the fact that Western companies haven't always behaved that well in the developing world. Corruption also perpetuates inequality, reduces confidence in governments, destabilizes the business environment, and arrests development. America has led the way with transparency standards for the extractive industries, requiring US-listed firms to disclose project by project the payments they make to foreign governments. The European Union and Canada have recently committed to equivalent standards. So collectively now, 83% of extractive companies are following the same code. Governments, of course, don't have all the answers to these problems. So we're also working very closely with the best NGOs, wherever they happen to be based. In our case, amongst others, we're working with the Clinton Health Access Initiative to reduce the cost of antiretroviral drugs in the developing world, and with the Gates Foundation to develop new technologies to make farming in poor countries more productive. And we engage with the private sector. Small example, we've worked with Vodafone to bring cell phone banking to Kenya in a system which now has 17 million users and handles transactions representing nearly a third of Kenya's GDP. The global distribution of power is therefore changing and evolving in a lot of different and unpredictable directions. We're moving rapidly, as William Hague has put it, to a G20 plus world, where power and wealth are not concentrated in the hands of the same old few, but increasingly dispersed around the globe where there are more and more important players. We've got to be willing to form new partnerships on specific issues, but accepting that we won't agree with those partners on everything. We work with China to help vulnerable countries like Bangladesh and Nepal prepare for natural disasters. But it doesn't prevent us from disagreeing openly and fundamentally with the Chinese government on human rights or the state's role in the economy. Britain and America share a set of values, free speech, free enterprise, rule of law. From Tunisia to Burma, these values continue to inspire people seeking change in their own political and private lives. It must stay that way. We've got to show that our political and economic systems not only still function, but still represent the best path to liberty and prosperity. This Friday marks another melancholy anniversary, in addition to the one today that I just mentioned for us, uh, given our history in Istanbul. Half a century since John Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. In his inaugural address, one of those many memorable things that he said was the following. To those peoples in the huts and villages of half the globe, we pledge our best efforts to help them help themselves. Fifty years on, I think the world is a different place. Much of Africa, for example, is now seen more as an opportunity 
than just a developmental challenge. But the moral and strategic imperative remains because, again, as JFK summed it up, if a free society can't help the many who are poor, it certainly can't save the few who are rich. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Westmacott. What a tour de force of uh, British policy interests. Uh, and of course, our condolences on the 10th anniversary. It seems hard to imagine yeah. it was 10 years ago, but yeah. uh, it's an important reminder of, of the important work our diplomats do. My name is Heather Conley. I'm Senior Fellow uh, and Director of the Europe Program here at CSIS. And we have, according to my watch, about a half an hour of some good questions and answers. I, I warn you, Ambassador Westmacott, this is a tough audience. They ask very, very tough questions. So what we'd like to do, uh, we're going to bundle to get as many in as we can. Can. Um, and then if you could, uh, we have some microphones, if you could give us your name and your affiliation, keep those comments short and those questions thought provoking and I think we can uh, go, go through quite a, a bit. Ambassador, I'd like to start us off, if, if I may, and take the moderator's prerogative and I would be fired as director of the Europe program if I did not talk about the UK's role in Europe as my topic of conversation. Um, there was an interesting op-ed in the New York Times yesterday with the title, Is Britain Sleepwalking Toward Disaster? And this was regarding uh, the referendum. Uh, and as I look, as much as the British role in the world is evolving and, and the, the, the role in Africa, the Middle East, Asia is growing, the dynamics within Europe are, are Incredible, just looking at the potential for Europe's, uh, uh, Britain's uh, referendum on its EU membership, Scottish referendum of independence next year, conversations, intense conversations with Spain over Gibraltar, lots of dynamism. So I would, I would welcome your thoughts uh, in the next several months to years of the UK's role in Europe, its leadership, and as Phil Gordon, former Assistant Secretary of State, noted in London in January that, ref I quote, referendums have often turned countries inward. And every hour at an EU summit spent debating about the institutional makeup the Euro of the European Union is one less hour spent talking about how we can solve <coughs> our common challenges. So I'm going to start with a, a hardball, I think, and I'd love your thoughts on that. <coughs> well, I knew we'd start with a nice, easy question. Um, I think that well, there are several different issues which are, which are out there as part of the United Kingdom and its role in Europe and indeed the future of Europe. Let me chuck out a few thoughts. One, the United Kingdom is not alone in having a public opinion which is asking itself a lot of questions about where the European Union has got to uh, and where it is headed. Part of this is to do with what's happened in the Eurozone, of which we are not members, but which has had a financial meltdown even more significant, if you like, than the European Union as a whole, where some of us have remained outside the Eurozone uh, and carried on as masters of our own economy and our own currency. Nevertheless, I think it has had an impact on general perceptions of Europe. So too has uh, the movement towards integration and the growth of European institutions, which have, for whatever reason, led public opinion to ask itself some questions about whether the right degree of what we call subsidiarity still applies. In other words, are the member states still being allowed to control their own destinies and their own futures to the extent that they should be in those areas which don't need to be governed collectively as part of uh, the Brussels institution? And it's not 100% different from the attitude in some states of the United States uh, towards federal authorities in, in the much hated Beltway. Um, why do we have to have those guys telling us what to do uh, in the federal authorities when we're perfectly happy to be our own states? There's a very loose parallel sometimes with those sentiments. And this has combined with a period of, of economic difficulty where people have been struggling. 
and where sometimes they have felt that Europe's institutions haven't been directly related to the realities of you know, fiscal deficit reduction programs uh, and other problems. Uh, together with the European Parliament, an institution which has got more and more powers, uh, beginning to get into territory where some public opinions say, well, hang on, what about our national parliament? Is it really right to have those responsibilities given to the European Parliament? So what you've got is in a number of countries, Britain is one, but it's not the only one, is a degree of what has become known as Euroscepticism, and people saying, has this all gone a bit too far? Should we call halt? Uh, are they spending too much of our, of our tax dollars? And should we be looking again at, at how Europe works? And what my prime minister has done, because of the degree of Euroscepticism, partly within his own party, but also in public opinion more generally, is to commit himself, should he receive the necessary mandate at the next general election in Britain, which is in May 2015, to renegotiate the terms of membership and to seek fresh consent from the British people for membership of the European Union. Uh, we do not know whether there will necessarily be, whether there will definitely be that referendum. Depends on the general election result in, in, in uh, 2015. But that is his commitment. It is, in my judgment, a strategy to keep Britain in the European Union, not to take Britain out of the European Union. But it is a strategy to address the, the sense of public concern about whether that's the right place for us, and to lay to rest the continuing debate about whether we should, whether we shouldn't be, should we leave, should we stay, uh, and to try to make Europe work better, improve its competitiveness, improve its accountability, um, make it function better in a way which public opinion in many different member states think is necessary. The last Pew Research uh, study that I looked at suggested that only in Germany did public opinion think that the answer to Europe's problems was more integration. Pretty well everywhere else said that, that is not the answer. Uh, the answer is, in fact, less Europe rather than more Europe. Now, it's a very crude uh, judgment, but th those were the questions which were being put. So we're addressing issues which are also being posed in France, in Sweden, in Denmark, in, in many other parts of the European Union, and which coincide with a sense that there are uh, some European economies which are doing poorly and some which are doing extremely well, where we haven't dealt with the structural imbalances between the strong and the weak, uh, where the fiscal union isn't really in place, where you've got a banking union which is agreed in principle but isn't quite there, where the banks are still not doing what public opinion thinks they should be doing, lending finance for growth to small and medium-sized enterprises, um, and making contribution to the uh, escape from the, the European and the global recession. So uh, that's what we're addressing. We're addressing an issue which is partly British but also Europe-wide, uh, but which is fundamental to, I think, uh, charting the course of the years to come. Our go my government's view remains uh, that the British interest remains in being a major player at the heart of a strong, properly functioning, accountable, competitive European Union. Uh, and it's in that framework that I think you should see the strategy of uh, improving terms of membership, improving the workings of European institutions, seeking fresh consent from the British people, and marching ahead with an even better Europe than we have at the moment. Thank you. All right, let's bring you into the conversation. All right, we have a question here, right here, Linda. Good morning, Ambassador. Um, my question is about the sort you, of the, you, uh, Sorry, I'm Patrick Wilson. I work for Babcock and Wilcox. My question is more about the U.S. role in the topic of the day. For a long time in the Iran and even in the Syria uh, context, the U.S. was the bad cop and Europe, and particularly the U.K., acted as the good cop in those relationship, uh, in those negotiations. What does it mean for the current state of play when the United States appears to be more interested in being a good cop itself? Thank you. We'll take a question, Linda, right, right. Um, Peter Foster with the London Daily Telegraph. Uh, just on uh, further following on the Iran question, how concerned are you that the um, determination by some Republicans to push for further sanctions uh, against Iran um, could have an impact on the negotiations uh, with Iran, particularly assuming that you get an interim deal uh, and we have this six-month window uh, at which we test the Iranians, as you said. Um, how concerned are you that those uh, that pressure for sanctions in Congress could impact those negotiations towards a final agreement if there is going to be one. If I can just jump in, jump in on the first question just for a little uh, bit of clarification. How much, you talked about uh, connecting and getting more input from the British people about 
the Europe, Europe's role. The Commons vote on Syria, was that an indication, a very strong public mandate about uh, the UK not being as outwardly engaged militarily in the future? And I think in some ways that was drawing on your question about uh, Syria and the good cop, bad cop role there. Thank you, please. Um, good cops, bad cops. <laughs> I think that uh, I don't see the United States' role in this as having uh, evolved from being a, a, a bad cop to becoming a good cop in the negotiations uh, with the Iranians. I think where we are is in uh, seeking to address a problem which has been out there for a decade or so, where some people would argue there have been some missed opportunities to arrest or certainly slow down the Iranian nuclear program at earlier, at, at earlier stages back in 2004, five, maybe 2009, maybe 2007. All sorts of discussions took place, none of which actually got anywhere for one reason or another. And as a result, we have got uh, an Iranian nuclear program which has continued to, to advance with yet more centrifuges of yet higher quality uh, with a parallel uh, exercise in terms of the development of heavy water reactor uh, as well as the enrichment going ahead and growing international concern that this uh, could lead to um, a military product which would give Iran nuclear weapons which it, we believe does not have at the moment. So um, what the P5 plus one negotiations I think are intended to do is, is not play games of good, back, good cop, bad cop but to see whether in the context of an Iranian government uh, which has been through an important presidential election, which has got new leadership uh, and which has put more real substance on the table than we've ever seen before on these nuclear issues, whether there is now an opportunity for us coming together, not as good guys and bad guys, and we are united on this, the P5 plus one, uh, with a plan which we can all subscribe to which brings the Iranians back from uh, where we believe them to be at the moment and uh, very significantly reduces, hopefully reduce, eliminates altogether, um, but that, I don't want to deal with absolutes, but, but you know, moves us away from uh, the position where we are at the moment where we fear that at relatively short notice Iran could have uh, nuclear weapons. I think we're working on this together. It is perfectly natural when you get into a negotiation where you've got Iran on one side and the P5 plus one, so six other governments on the other side, plus Kathy Ashton holding the ring, uh, and the P5 plus one feeling that they are operating on behalf of the international community and a number of regional powers which have got very legitimate security concerns of their own, it's very normal that we should be debating amongst ourselves uh, exactly what sort of uh, deal there should be. Where we are now, and we've got there at, in pretty short order actually, is um, uh, a piece of paper which is out there, which details remain uh, confidential, which gives us the chance of a first step understanding between the P5 plus and the Iranians, uh, which would freeze and in some cases roll back where they are at the moment and increase inspection arrangements so that we've got a greater degree of certainty about what's going on and gives us then a chunk of time, which might be a few months, might be a few weeks, to be discussed, long enough anyway, to see whether the Iranians are sufficiently engaged on the substance of all this stuff to be ready to uh, subscribe to a comprehensive settlement which reassures the region and the rest of us about their nuclear intentions and to an extent that allows us uh, to wind back a significant portion of the sanctions which have played such an important role in bringing us to the present stage. So I think we're talking about um, a first step, which is reversible, which is worth having, um, which is better than the status quo, but which is still pretty modest. Uh, let's see if we can do that. We happen to share the view of the United States government and the rest of the P5 plus one that it's worth having. There are other people, some of them on Capitol Hill, as you were saying. Uh, there are other governments which are nervous about this. In any negotiation, it always seems to me it's always pretty well impossible for every party to get 100% of what they want if the other party is going to agree uh, to the result of that negotiation. So there's got to be a degree of understanding and give and take. But this will not be done uh, on the basis of blind trust. There will have to be 
controls, verification, inspection. We'll have to know what's going on, given the uh, very poor record the Iranians have had over the years of misleading people and not telling the entire truth about their nuclear program. Um, do the, does the threat of uh, the sanctions from the US Congress uh, impede all that? Well, I think we've always known that the Congress has its views, the administration has its views. Uh, I have some friends in the Congress uh, who feel that the interim first step that we're talking about at the moment uh, gives too much to the Iranian side in exchange for not sufficient uh, certainty uh, about where they will be going. It's not the view of the administration. But frankly, if there is pressure, whether it's through the Banking Committee or whether it's through the National Defense Authorization Act or through some other, um, some other legislative framework uh, to pile on more sanctions, well, one thing that, that does convey uh, to our Iranian friends, partners in this negotiation, uh, is that public opinion and, and uh, uh, political opinion on Capitol Hill does remain, does still require a great deal of convincing of Iranian good faith if we are to be able to uh, move towards uh, a comprehensive settlement at the end of this current negotiation. So I think it's a, it's a political reality. We'll see what happens. I personally very much hope that we will at least have time to see whether the negotiation on the first step arrangement uh, can succeed uh, before we get to the stage of having additional sanctions applied one way or another. Uh, but we'll have to see uh, where all the different players come out in this, um, in this particular exercise. But what is very clear is that this is a, a very major um, political diplomatic issue in which the stakes are very high, but unfortunately the levels of trust are pretty low. Absolutely. Please, we have a question there and then a question over there. Thank you very much. I'm John Schwenk with BAE Systems. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about the impact um, on, of British budget cuts for their defense on manning levels and sort of say number of aircraft and ships uh, being built and acquired. I'm curious on your views on the subsequent ability um, for the UK to then engage with those lower numbers and with the less equipment around the globe, not only in response to sort of emergencies and, and crises, but on a day-to-day -day security cooperation basis as well. Thank you. Great, and we have one question there. Uh, Vince Morelli with the Congressional Research Service, following up on Heather's theme initially and that question now. <clears throat> the EU has a big summit coming up next month on security and defense policy review. And I'm wondering if your government has any going in position uh, to this summit. Do you have any expectations at all for the outcomes of this summit? And does this summit maybe portend a very large and internal European discussion of where it goes in the future with respect to defense and security issues, which will culminate in a discussion at NATO's um, summit next year on, on where NATO goes in post-Afghanistan. And I'm gonna two-finger, uh, before the, the December Council meeting on the Common Security and Defense Policy, a very important Vilnius summit in less than two weeks about the Eastern Partnership countries and uh, uh, that agenda, so we'd welcome your thoughts on, on that as well. And I didn't answer your question really about what the House of Commons vote on Syria meant. So perhaps I'll I can, come back around. I can uh, <laughs> mop that up. I, th I think um, perhaps I can try to answer that as well as dealing with the question about defense cuts and what that means for the UK's um, credibility. Uh, let me say on, on the political side, uh, and touching on the House of Commons vote at the end of August on the question of whether or not to join the United States in taking military action uh, against Syria. Um, I don't myself think that that has got uh, profound, far-reaching implications for the United Kingdom's, um, whatever word you want to use, reliability as an ally. I think what it does show, uh, just as the uh, decision to go to the United States Congress on the very same issue shows, and just as the polling of public opinion in France, which was the other country which was ready to take military action, shows, uh, is that public opinion these days in all of our Western democracies uh, is pretty circumspect about the idea of foreign military involvements, especially where there is not a perceived, visible, direct threat to their own national security. So the fact that public opinion polling was showing that there was a majority against taking military action against Syria, even after the clear use of industrial scale 
uh, application of chemical weapons by the Assad regime is, I think, an indication that public opinion in all of our countries uh, is not so sure about military action and wants to be very clear about the rationale. This is partly the legacy of 2003 and Iraq. Uh, it is partly uh, people saying, well, can we entirely trust what politicians, generals, spies, everybody else tells us of what's going on? Uh, and it's also a sense of, is there not a limit to which we can solve other people's internal problems? So I think there's a, it's more a sign, I think, of public opinion asking itself some searching questions at a time when, let's never forget this, military action overseas is expensive and people are very worried about their own pocketbook issues uh, and about cuts that are being applied uh, domestically to things that touch them directly as a result of deficit reduction programs. I think it's more that than anything else. Uh, and I would underline that on the issue of Syria, uh, my government's view was that it did wish uh, the parliament to give consent to the United Kingdom joining the United States if the United States was going to take military action. It was the parliament uh, that decided otherwise, uh, but actually decided otherwise for a number of different reasons. Uh, the, the vote was only 13 uh, short of the majority, and some of the people who would have voted the right way turned out to be not present in the voting lobby on the day. There was a there was a degree of cock-up more than there was a, a, an issue of conspiracy, if I can put it that way, uh, in the way in which the numbers in the end came out. That's not in any sense to say that this was not uh, a key sovereign judgment and decision and vote by the British Parliament, uh, but I wouldn't attach uh, too much importance to what that meant about Britain's view of its place in the world or of the uh, relationship with the United States. Um, I think more generally on uh, defense capabilities and so on, we have taken uh, quite a strategic view to what we are trying to do with our uh, defense budget. We are one of the very few European countries which, of course, still exceed the 2% of uh, GDP spending uh, commitment of the NATO countries. But we've also taken steps in the last few years in our strategic defense reviews to try to ensure that we're spending that money on having people and skills and equipment which allow us to respond to what we think are most likely to be the threats which we are facing over the next couple of decades. That's why we're building a couple of aircraft carriers. That's why we're going to have uh, ships to put on, uh, aircraft to put on them. We will have the right version of the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. And we will have some helicopters. We won't have them all quite at the same time, but we will get there um, before too long. And we retain a, an ability to operate at long range, at short notice, to take uh, action where there is a real need to do so. We have, we believe, uh, one of the finest special forces in the world. Uh, we have a lot of equipment to allow them to do the right thing. Uh, and we have uh, tried to ensure that our procurement programs buys the right equipment at the right price, often coming from the United States of America, uh, to enable us to uh, fulfill uh, those, those tasks. Uh, our armed forces, in terms of numbers, are indeed getting smaller. Uh, but I think the important point to make about defense spending, it's not just about the headline figure. It's how you spend it, what you do with it, what your posture is, and how willing you are uh, to, to, to risk blood and treasure in defense of the values you stand up for. And I think our record in Afghanistan and a number of other countries uh, recently shows that the United Kingdom armed forces are ready and capable uh, of doing what is necessary when uh, our government and, and the British people decide that it's right to do so for our national security interests and indeed because of our alliance commitments. So I think um, if you had a booming budget, if you had uh, lots more revenue, if you had a huge surplus, there may well be people in my parliament who would say, let's put a bit more into the defense pot. Uh, but I think we're holding our own uh, in a very difficult uh, fiscal environment and for the first time in very many years, and rather uniquely amongst uh, NATO allies, we've even managed to balance our books in terms of our defense budget, which is a very healthy basis on which to make future procurement and other commitment decisions. So I do think we're in, in, in too bad a place. We would all like to have more money for lots of different things, um, as would the British Foreign Office, um, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's really not too bad, and it is genuinely strategic the way in which we've looked afresh at the commitments and the resources that we've got available uh, and our procurement programs. As for future summits, um, I'm not able to give you any brilliant insights into the, the next round of, of the European consideration of all that. Um, uh, we are already beginning to think what hosting the next NATO summit in a year's time, less than a year's time, next September, 
uh, is going to mean. We're very proud of that. Of course, we are not the ones who set the agenda. That will be the NATO Secretariat, Secretary General uh, and the various member states. But we will be uh, holding the ring, if you like, and providing the facilities for it. So it will be something which we will be caring about a great deal. And we will be attaching a lot of importance to try to ensure that the alliance uh, knows what it's for uh, and is transforming itself in the correct ways under the guidance of the Supreme Allied Commander Transformation, Norfolk, Virginia, uh, and other leadership figures of the alliance uh, so that NATO is increasingly fit for purpose, interoperable, and as smart as it needs to be rather than stuck in some of the uh, old forms of thinking uh, which characterized much of its operations uh, in the old days back in, in the time of Cold War and so on. But I don't think I can give you much more, I'm afraid, in terms of insights for the, the, the European summit meeting on our defense and international security at this point. Okay. We have two questions there, John, and then back right there. Good morning. Uh, John Evans, formerly of the State Department and a colleague of Heather's. Um, Mr. Ambassador, you invoked the uh, anniversary this week of the end of the Kennedy administration, which brings to mind uh, that Arnold Toynbee, in the last year of the Kennedy administration, gave a speech which he called the continuing effect of the American Revolution. And of course he did that uh, as a kind of challenge to the Kennedy stance uh, that we would bear any burden in the promotion and protection of democracy abroad. And I just wanted to ask you if you think we have uh, recalibrated, we and the UK have to some extent needed to recalibrate our commitment to promoting democracy. It's, it's a subject that comes up intermittently here. Or have, we, have we gone too far in trying to, to uh, promote some of our values? Uh, and just where do we stand on that today? Thank you. And Linda, there's one back there. Yes, Terry Murphy with CSIS and also with the British American Business Association. I was in London two weeks ago and the British press was filled with stories about the uh, shift of uh, the closing down of the shipyard in, in Portsmouth and the shifting of, of construction of the British carrier to Scotland. And quotes, I think, from your Minister for, for Defense, I'm not sure, but pretty pretty senior person, making it pretty clear that were Scotland to, to opt out of the, Europe, uh, the United Kingdom, that would make it a, quote, foreign country, and it would be against anybody's strategic idea to build carriers in a foreign country. That seemed to, and the press took that as a pretty explicit threat to uh, let the Scots know that there were gonna be some co consequences, pretty specific consequences, if they were to vote to separate. Now, you didn't mention any of that, Mr. Ambassador, in your discussions of re referenda, but I thought you might want to seize the moment to say something on it to, now. <laughs> or, or, or to say, we're not letting you off the hook on that question. I think we can take one more, and then we will let you decide. Yes, ma'am, right there. You can answer those tough questions. I told you this was a tough group. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Davika Bat from the Times of London. Um, just back on Iran, um, as you yourself acknowledge, some countries have expressed grave reservations about what's happening in Geneva at the moment. Um, and one of those concerns has been the speed at which things seem to be progressing. Have you any concerns about that? And could you just talk a bit more about how quickly the process seems to uh, take place? Okay. Um, are we too enthusiastic about promoting democracy and our values uh, abroad. Well, I think I'd just make a, a, a couple of comments. Uh, my own view is that uh, it is difficult, sometimes dangerous, and sometimes arrogant to try to suggest to other people that they should run their countries uh, on the lines that we run ours, uh, not least because it's taken the United States and the United Kingdom and most other democracies represented here uh, several hundred years to evolve the, in every case, somewhat imperfect arrangement uh, that we try to make work to the best of our ability. Uh, and we have seen from bitter experience that trying to transplant uh, a slowly evolved Western democracy with all the institutions that go with it overnight from an authoritarian dictatorship uh, into something akin to what we uh, know and love in our own countries 
is a pretty damn difficult thing to do. Um, so I think we need to be very wary about how far we go down that path. The second thing I would say is that I think it is worth remembering that in all those Arab Spring countries where political change took place one after the other, it was all internal. None of this was coming from the outside. And the interesting thing was that the revolts against the largely kind of Arab nationalist dictatorships, it wasn't the monarchies, interestingly, which many people thought were perhaps going to be the most fragile. It was the, it was the other ones uh, which were the most vulnerable in Libya, in Tunisia, in, uh, in, in Egypt, uh, in Syria. Um, the values which people were espousing were in many cases the kind of freedom of speech, market economics, uh, freedom of opportunity, rights for women, um, secular functioning government kind of agenda that the rest of us might have proposed if we were in charge, but we weren't. Uh, and I think it's an indication of the success, if you like, of the export of our values, even when we're not seeking to impose them on other societies, that it was precisely that kind of stuff which motivated uh, many of the people who were leading that revolution. Actually, that was part of what was behind the Iranian revolution, 1978, 79. We've forgotten that because like Russian revolutions and French revolutions previously, uh, quite often brave, rather moderate uh, individuals who are the first ones to, uh, to raise the flag uh, get taken over by more uh, extreme groups which tend, out, tend to be more organized uh, and more determined to take control of the revolutions. So I think that uh, there's absolutely nothing to be uh, reticent about in terms of the, uh, the validity of the model that we've got uh, even though in each place, as I was saying, it's a little bit different and, and no doubt a bit imperfect and has taken a long time to evolve, but precisely because I think uh, many other societies have sought to emulate it rather than because we have tried to impose it uh, at the point of a bayonet. So I think um, uh, it's very much up to others to make their judgments. Then there's the question of what do we do in support of those uh, people who are seeking greater freedoms which are aligned with our values. Uh, that is a very difficult issue because one wants to be supportive, especially if they ask for it, rather than we are imposing it. But then there's the issue, which I understand that President Obama has often posed to his national security staff, I can see how I get in, but tell me how I then get out afterwards. So uh, there is the, there's the fingers in the mangle issue if you start becoming too directly involved in the domestic political evolution of other countries which are not your direct responsibility. I think you'll be very careful. I think there's quite a lot that one can do. Uh, there are certain things you shouldn't do. And I'm afraid that the Syria example from which probably you know, none of us really emerge with, with total credit is an example of just how difficult it is to make that judgment call and to get it, and to get it right. And the, the debate continues to rage. Uh, I think none of us are washing our hands. We are all desperately trying to build on a little bit of successful diplomacy on chemical weapons management to try to move towards a political transition which will stop the slaughtering and the humanitarian catastrophe of Syria. Um, but it is a difficult exercise, and there are an awful lot of different groups inside Syria, some domestic, some of them imported from elsewhere, uh, which are making that task more difficult. I think it's right to try, uh, but we have to do it in support of uh, local people rather than trying to impose something from the outside. Um, Portsmouth, Scotland, and building aircraft carriers, slightly different subject. Um, there are some people in the United Kingdom who seem to think that there was some link between the fact that the last prime minister has a constituency close to where the aircraft carrier is being built in Scotland, uh, that that was where the final assembly took place. I have no possible comment uh, on, on all that. Um, but it is a, a fair point to say that if Scotland was not going to be part of the United Kingdom, the decisions like that would probably be uh, more difficult to take. There are a lot of issues out there which need to be thought through as people prepare their vote in the referendum next September, not very far away, it's only about 10 months. Um, and I think defense is one of them, shipyards is certainly one. Uh, where will the UK nuclear deterrent be based in the future? Because at the moment our submarines are mainly based uh, at Fastlane, which is in Scotland. Uh, there are other people who say, well, what about the monarchy? If you're going to be independent, uh, what about the Queen and Balmoral? Um, there are others who say currency. You know, how are you going to operate on the question of a, do you stick with the UK currency or do you go it alone? And I think some of those who were keen uh, on Scottish independence also made the assumption 
that there would be an automatic membership of the European Union and of NATO and the United Nations and so on, uh, which flows from the Declaration of Independence. Um, it doesn't necessarily flow like that, and the European institutions have made clear that Scotland would have to apply like anybody else uh, if he wanted to be a member of the European Union. So I think there's a whole bunch of questions which are out there which need to be thought through fiscal policy, defense policy, political institutions, membership of international organizations, uh, funding of Scotland's wonderful health and higher education systems. You know, where would that come from in the future? Uh, would Scotland, Scotland's own tax take be sufficient for that? I think a lot of questions which are being asked, quite rightly. Um, but the British government's view is that because in Scottish uh, elections, um, a party was elected with a mandate to hold a referendum, that it is our duty to facilitate that referendum. We will do all that we need to do to ensure that it happens, uh, and we will respect the outcome of that referendum. But I think uh, the questions you raise about defense are uh, one of a series of questions which are, are out there on the agenda and will need to be thought through uh, by people who are casting a vote, which does not include, by the way, those of us who live south of the border. Uh, are we rushing ahead on Iran too fast? You know, we spent many years trying to uh, do something um, to slow down, if not reverse, the Iranian nuclear program. Um, somebody reminded me the other day that we could have had a deal. I simplify, but this is the uh, We could have had a deal with 165 centrifuges about eight years ago, and there's now 18,000 of them. Uh, and the longer we don't have a deal, the more centrifuges there will be wearing away, the more there will be installed, and maybe the higher quality they will have. Uh, and, and, and. So I think we've spent a long time looking at this issue. We've come quite close, as I was mentioning before, to one or two um, agreements over the last decade. So it's not as if the subject is brand new. And one of the reasons why the British government thinks that um, it is right to move ahead on the basis of the, of the current outline first step agreement is that the longer we don't have an agreement to stop and roll back what's happening now, then the more centrifuges there will be, the more enriched uranium we will have, the further progress we made towards the uh, installation and equipping of a heavy water reactor, which we don't think is uh, a good idea. And if we don't go uh, ahead with what's on offer now, we won't either have the benefit of what I understand are significantly improved inspection arrangements which are in that interim agreement. But it is only a first step. Uh, it does not include the winding back of any of the core financial or other oil sanctions. Uh, it is reversible. It's a first step. Uh, we think uh, that it's the right thing to do, and we think that it is unlikely uh, that we're going to get uh, an Iranian government, president, foreign minister, and other negotiators uh, who are more committed to trying to find a way forward uh, than the present team resulting from the last uh, Iranian presidential elections where I think it looks to the rest of the world as though the Iranian people voted for somebody who was not the automatic preference of the regime, but was somebody uh, who believed that it was time to change course. And there is therefore perhaps an opportunity to test whether they're serious about that. And no real benefit, uh, as long as we're satisfied that there is an appropriate balance in this first step, no real benefit in saying no, uh, let's spend another year or two or three talking about it. And there may even be an issue about whether those who have taken some political risk, if they have, perhaps they have, in Iran, or whether it would be weakening for their policy of engagement to go home with nothing and no agreement. And I think that's also a legitimate issue which has been uh, ventilated in quite a lot of the commentary uh, around these negotiations. Ambassador Westmacott, thank you so much. Almost 40 years ago, a very young, a child diplomat by the name of Peter Westmacott, fresh out of language training, arrived in Tehran in 1974, right, as your first posting. Yeah. I find it extraordinary that we sit here today as British ambassador talking about a potentially historic moment vis-a-vis -vis Iran. So thank you for that full circle moment, and thank you all for joining us. And let me, sorry, just a little, a little tiny coda just for fun because Heather has raised that. Um, I do remember when I was a baby diplomat, uh, Persian-speaking Persian in about 1975, that uh, America, France, Germany, Russia, Britain, to name but five, 
governments were all queuing up to win the contracts to help the Shah of Iran develop his civil nuclear program. <laughs> That's a great last one. Thank you all. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Heather. Was so that all right? Much okay. I hope, I hope I didn't say too many things that are going to embarrass me in the British papers. You're going to be fine. <laughs> they, they just drank it up. Thank you so much. That's